when it comes to horror games, I think few do it better than the Alien series, and I think throughout the years we've actually been pretty lucky. Gotcha, bitch! Two of the earliest games also happened to be on the same platform, the PlayStation. Yeah, and this little grey bad boy here gave us some of the best horror titles of all time. Resident Evil 1 and 2, Silent Hill, and case in point, Alien Trilogy and Alien Resurrection. Two games both set in the same universe, but both being vastly different. I actually did a video on Alien Trilogy a few years ago, but I never got around to covering Resurrection, and seeing as it's the whole spooky season and everything, I thought it might be worth going back and taking a look at both of these games, especially considering they're still mostly decent. Mostly. So, let's move like we got a purpose and check these two out, shall we? Now, having to deal with face huggers and chest bursters is obviously pretty scary, but then again, so is the thought of having someone stealing all your personal data. Yeah, it's probably a pretty good point here to thank my sponsor, ExpressVPN, for sponsoring this video. It's not enough anymore to just go into incognito mode when you're going to be browsing the net, and if you don't want people to be able to see what you're doing, well, then a VPN is essential. VPN is short for a virtual private network, and what this thing does is reroute all your data through a secure encrypted server, meaning people can't gain access to it. If you don't use one, it's kind of like going to the toilet and leaving the door open, or going to bed with an open face hugger egg sitting in the room. It's really good for things like torrenting, in case you want to keep your activity hidden from your ISP. Honestly, I think I've found it the most useful for streaming sites like Netflix, because some of the content on there is just really limited when it comes to Australia. But then if I change my country to somewhere like the US, I can get access to entirely different movies and shows. Like The Exorcist 3, for instance, I mean, it's one of the most underrated horror films of all time, but for some reason, not available in Australia. Now though, I can simply change my location and whoop, there it is. Now, I'd never recommend a product that I don't use myself, and I've been using ExpressVPN for going on over a year now. So if you want to join the club and get three extra months for free, well then head on over to expressvpn.com slash gman and get started. <laughs> Alien Trilogy was actually one of the games that came with our PlayStation when my parents first bought one back in the day. And I still have this vivid memory of hooking the whole thing up and playing through this with my dad for the first time. Looks like love at first sight to me. Speaking of memories, this thing also I think has one of the most memorable cheat codes of all time. And anyone who's played it, I think is definitely going to remember it. To this day, I still can't look at pink boots without thinking about it. This code also saved me a lot of heartache, considering I probably would have never finished this thing without it. As this game scared the absolute piss out of me back then. As in, piss left my body. Even now, playing it in 2021, there's just something about the atmosphere that's really tense and foreboding. The limited draw distance of the PlayStation actually works really well in keeping the game feeling mysterious. Barely being able to see a few feet ahead of you just worked really well with the whole horror vibe they're going for. And it really earned its place as a memorable console shooter that kind of worked as great nightmare fuel for an adolescent kid. There was actually a PC port for the game as well, which is harder to find than photos of your mum with her clothes on. Baby. And the main difference with this version is that Ripley actually talks throughout the game. Mostly just in the form of spouting off these terrible one-liners like she's doing a bad impersonation of Duke Nukem. But for some reason, it seems this version removes these incredibly important rearming levels, which are these ones which give you extra ammo in between the main missions, which is kind of an odd omission. I never played this version back when it first came out, so I don't know if it was an issue back then, but playing it now emulated through DOSBox, the whole thing just has horrendous slowdown. Which really just makes it borderline unplayable, like it gave me a headache after playing for 15 minutes. What this all means is that, as a result, I think the PlayStation version is the best one to go with, simply because it doesn't suffer from this to the same extent. But that's fine, because I got a brand spanking new Retro Tink 5X, and I'm always in the mood for some good old fashioned PlayStation dithering. And short of those cucks over at Night Dive Studios somehow managing to remaster this thing, well, playing it this way is gonna have to do. So, story wise, Alien Trilogy is kinda like this weird combination of all three of the original films. The whole thing opens with Ripley returning to LV-426 with Bishop and a squad of Colonial Marines, exactly like the premise from the second film. They're inside the facility for all of five seconds before they're suddenly attacked and the Marines are absolutely slaughtered in what might be one of the most badass intro cinematics of all time. 
You even get to see this poor Marine get his head ripped off his shoulders, like, damn. Then the whole thing ends with Ripley being the only survivor and having to continue on alone. From this point on, the game's broken down into three episodes with about 10 levels or so each, requiring you to explore these various environments and complete all these objectives. This could be something like flipping a bunch of switches to allow for easier entry for the cleanup crew, putting cocoon survivors out of their misery and collecting their ID tags, or just cleaning house, and killing aliens or rogue synthetics. Each episode also has its own unique theme. The first episode looks like the environment seen in Aliens, the second episode is a prison complex similar to Alien 3, and then the final episode is set inside the bone ship, similar to the beginning of Alien. Each episode then ends in a boss fight against a queen, which is really easy for one very key reason. You see, when enemies get hit by bullets, they get stunned for like a second or so, where they go into this pain animation where they can't move, and because the queen is a big old bitch, it's kind of easy to just kind of stun lock her in place so she can't even fight back. I mean, at all. So ironically, the toughest and the strongest Xeno of them all really ends up being the easiest. Each chapter then ends with this really cool cinematic showing Ripley making her way to the next part of the facility, showing off some really impressive motion capture that was kind of cutting edge for its time. Even if Ripley does have these super long arms like she's a chimpanzee or something. I think praise has to also be given to the soundtrack in this game as well, composed by a guy named Steven Root. It's honestly one of the better soundtracks for its time and that track from the opening levels just really burned into my brain. I mean, if the music in a horror game isn't making you feel uneasy and depressed, well, then it's not doing its job right, let me tell you. This game, along with the first Doom, is really responsible for giving me a bunch of nightmares as a kid, and I think the soundtrack played a huge part in that. What really makes Alien Trilogy so much fun, though, is that it really is just one giant piece of fan service, and almost every aspect of it is something that's been taken from the films. Even right from that opening cinematic, showing that UCM dropship flying across a rain-soaked LV-426, hearing the voiceover with Burke being briefed by some unseen Wayland yutani suit, through to seeing Ripley and that squad of Marines entering the base, I mean, the whole thing just oozes with authenticity and a lot of love for the series. The weapons, the enemies, and the environments are just like a collage of elements and themes from the franchise. I mean, Ripley's pistol, for instance, is the same one that Gorman uses from the second film, even down to using the exact same sound effect. And just like in the movie, that thing is about as effective as harsh language. You've got a shotgun for close encounters, of course, and this thing kind of looks similar to the one that Hicks uses for all of five minutes in the movie. This. And I really like too how the reload animation for this thing has Ripley just kind of turning it to the side when she pumps the forearm back. In a sea of FPS shotguns, something as simple as a reload animation like this always seemed to make this weapon stand out to me just a little bit more. Then you've got the pulse rifle with its 10mm explosive caseless and its instantly recognizable sound effect when firing. It's also got that alternate fire mode of the grenade launcher, you know, if you want to mess around with that. There's a flamethrower as well, which I rarely found myself using though, only because it burns through ammo so quickly, no pun intended. But I'd argue that this is probably one of the series' more iconic weapons. I mean, it appeared in both the first two films, and I think almost every other game as well. Baby, baby. Then finally, later in the game, you've got the smart gun, which is able to target and fire it up to three enemies at once, as long as they're standing in front of you. And I don't think there's ever been an iteration of this weapon that hasn't absolutely kicked ass. Instead of throwable grenades, you can find seismic charges, which are used to destroy weakened walls, and I think this is probably the most insane reference. Because I think someone mentioned seismic charges maybe once in Aliens, there's like a single line of throwaway dialogue about it. Uh, we got some explosive damage, it's probably seismic survey charges. Now they've included it as a weapon in the game, and it just shows that whoever worked on this game was clearly a huge fan of the source material. The enemies include face huggers, chest bursters, warriors, and the little dog xenos from the third film, along with some new additions like a more advanced version of the dog alien, and then a bunch of humanoid enemies like security guards, soldiers, and even rogue synthetics armed with smart guns. They kind of remind me of Dolph Lundgren in Rocky IV. I must break you. On the subject of enemies, I've always thought that this game's also had a really odd approach to the way it handles the facehuggers. 
For some reason, instead of these things being an instant game over if they hit you, instead they only do a couple of points of damage before then having the common decency to kill themselves. During this time, they cover the entire screen in a pixelated mess, kind of like watching POV Japanese porn, but that's about the worst it ever gets. Funnily enough too, they also seem to be the enemies with the highest sense of self-preservation because a lot of the time they just outright run away from you. They're often hidden in crates, which annoyingly is where you also find a lot of spare health and ammo. So you'll shoot a crate only for one of these things to pop out and run off into the darkness. And because they seem to get a couple of seconds of invulnerability when they first appear, you usually can't kill them before they manage to scuttle off. And I'm not kidding too when I say that there's so many of these things that this game has to win some kind of award for having the most amount of facehuggers in an Aliens game. Oh great. Wonderful. Shit. What's also really awesome too I think is how you get these unique death scenes depending on what enemy killed you. So the death you get from a facehug is going to be completely different to that from a warrior. Overall, the whole thing still plays decent enough, but as you would expect for a game made almost 30 years ago, this thing has definitely seen better days, and there's more than a few signs of wear and tear here with certain aspects. Shit. Mostly, I think, just in regards to the controls. You see, this was before the days of thumbsticks being the norm, so you're forced into using the D-pad, which ain't all that smooth. There's no option for turning on auto run, and having to turn around when something is behind you is painfully slow. The PC version actually had a button map there to be able to do a quick 180, which was incredibly useful. And that's something they'd also implement in Alien Resurrection, which we'll get to soon enough. Oh, great. But for some reason, I guess they ran out of buttons on the PlayStation controller, so it had to be cut. For some reason too, Ripley's strafe speed is much slower than simply moving forward or backward. And the limited space in some of these corridor environments makes circle strafing kind of impossible. Really just means that combat's going to be bottlenecked into one direction, usually in front of you. And it's a far cry from having to dodge projectiles from imps, caca demons, or barons of hell. Combat against the human enemies is also kinda laughable. These guys using weapons like pistols, pulse rifles, and smart guns, though instead of being hit scanners, they fire these visible projectiles, and you can literally see these bullets slowly moving through the air towards you. Being developed primarily for the PlayStation, this also means that the level design and the architecture is going to be pretty simple. You're not going to be seeing rooms above other rooms or anything like that. About the most verticality you're going to get is taking a lift up or down a single level. Sometimes you might see a Xeno running across the ceiling, but if an enemy's on a level above or below you, they're pretty much no threat at all. Most of the time you've just got to run around and press a bunch of buttons to gain access to lifts or locked doors, and that's about it. And it kind of gets to the point where most of the time I'm really just pressing every button I find without really thinking twice about what it's actually doing. In between some of the levels you're able to rearm, which means running around these simplistic areas with either a 30 or a 60 second time limit. Trying to collect as much ammo as possible before the timer runs out, and these don't even really feel like proper levels, like they're just glorified bonus stages. But they're actually really important, because ammo can be surprisingly scarce in this game. Is it scarce or scarce? In fact, early on in the game, there's a really important secret area that gives you the pulse rifle for the first time, and although it's a secret, I think if you actually miss it, you're going to be seriously under-equipped for the remainder of this first chapter. And I think that's kind of an issue because of how the difficulty modes work in this thing. You've got three modes, right? Essentially, easy, normal, and hard, though it's really more like normal, hard, and very hard. With the differences between all of these three being the amount of damage that enemies can take before being killed. You've got the same amount of enemies regardless, but the higher difficulty modes just seem to give them a stupid amount of health points. And it's kind of why I never really bother playing this game on hard mode, because everything just seems to feel so spongy. Then on hard mode, on top of that, enemies are also going to respawn, which is a big old pile of shit. The way that damage works in this game is also kind of interesting. Whenever you've got armor, instead of the armor absorbing a percentage of the damage, instead the armor absorbs all of the damage, kind of like a separate health bar. By far the weirdest mechanic though is what happens when you shoot enemies. So like I said earlier, when someone takes a hit, there's like a pain animation for a second or so, at which point they can't move, but also at which point any further damage you do to them has no effect. So what it means is that you have to fire in short controlled bursts. Now again, I don't know if this was a deliberate design choice meant to reference a single line of throwaway dialogue in the film. Remember, short controlled bursts 
but it does remove that sense of utter carnage from some of these weapons because simply holding down the fire button with the pulse rifle or the smart gun is just an outright waste of ammo because half your shots aren't going to hit jack shit. It's also what makes that flamethrower kind of underwhelming. Where Alien Trilogy really shits the bed though is during its third episode set inside the bone ship. Because at this point, for no real reason, what they've done is have what looks like solid walls, but they're actually passages you can walk through. I mean, they might have the texture of a solid wall, but for some reason you're able to walk through them. And it's not like they're leading to secret areas, this is the way you have to go to head forward. Fuck! The bone ship has a hub-like area called the core, and you're going to return here between these main levels to access different parts of the ship. And this is really just the same level replayed four or five times, just each time with there being new enemies added to it, and that just kind of feels lazy. The difficulty also starts to feel a bit artificial, with the return of a new variant of the warrior Xenos who have double the amount of health points of the ones you fought in the first episode. The zigzagging nature of their movements combined with the clunky controls and their high hit points makes them an absolute fucking chore to deal with. And if you're playing on hard or even normal mode, the amount of bullets it takes to down these guys is just ludicrous. Otherwise though, I can't really fault the presentation this episode, and the appearance of those alien handlers throughout this section is one of the main recurring things that I used to have nightmares about when I was a kid. There's just something about these guys that just really freaks me out man, even in the movie Alien 3 when you see them for all of 5 seconds. Like any good alien game set inside a bone ship should do, you also get to move through a room containing the corpse of the pilot. And then after finishing off the third and final alien queen, the whole thing ends with Ripley and Bishop barely escaping the planet as it explodes. And I gotta say that I do feel that complaining about a lot of these antiquated gameplay elements is a little bit unfair, considering they were the norm at the time. It'd be like complaining about Casablanca being shot on black and white film. Alien Trilogy is a relic from another era, but I think it's one that still holds up where it should the most, in the tone and the atmosphere. And I think that even by today's standards, people can look at it and understand that. Kind of funny to think how I could never beat this thing without cheating as a kid, but going back and playing it now, I'm able to finish it in a couple of sittings. It's definitely one of those games that would greatly benefit from some kind of remaster to PC, allowing for smoother mouse and keyboard controls and improved visuals. Considering at the moment the best way to play this thing I think is still on the PlayStation, or barring that, a Sega Saturn. You know, if you're one of the 12 people in the world who still owns one of those things. The basic gameplay loop is still pretty fun, running around and shooting face huggers and warrior xenos with a shotgun or a pulse rifle, and I think that basic improvement of smoother movement and aiming controls would be an absolute blessing. Not bad for a human. But I've got a bit of a secret to tell you, right? The only reason I really wanted to talk about Alien Trilogy was so I had an excuse to talk about Alien Resurrection. And it's taken me years to work up the courage to play through this thing from start to finish, but I finally did it. And at this point, we're really on the express elevated hell, going down. Now, I could probably spend an entire video talking about Alien Resurrection and why I think that movie is terrible. Must be a chick thing. But we're not really here for that, right? This is more about the video game adaptation itself. Developed by Argonaut Games and released exclusively for the PlayStation in 2000. And Argonaut Games had some pretty solid developer DNA. I mean, they created the awesome Star Fox for the Super Nintendo. Not to mention the Super FX chip that made it possible to run in the first place. Along with the Croc series for the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. Alien Resurrection, however, was something else entirely. Despite there being a lot of issues with this thing, which I'll get into soon enough, I do have to admit that as far as games based off films go, this one is overall pretty good, and you can't really fault it for its faithfulness. You're gonna make us all very proud. Assuming you're not familiar with the plot, well, here's a bit of a recap. Set a couple of centuries after Alien 3, Wayland yutani is now ancient history, with the United Systems military now taking their place as that shady super conglomerate performing illegal experiments out in space where apparently, still, no one can hear you scream. The game mostly follows the film in terms of the overall story, you're still playing as a clone of Ripley on the USM Ariga, and have to find the means to escape after all the Xenos have gotten up to no good and started making trouble in the neighborhood. Yeah, what a shock, trying to contain and use the Xenos as bioweapons goes horribly wrong, again. 
For most of the missions here, you're going to be playing as Ripley, but you'll also get to play through as Winona Ryder's character, Call, along with De Stefano, the Marine who almost made it through the entire movie, and Christy, the dual pistol wielding badass who would rather let himself drown to death than simply grab onto a nearby railing. I mean, dude, it's right there. <laughs> Along the way too, you'll see some pretty similar themes. Escaping from the cells as Ripley, for instance. There's even a whole chapter where you've got to find and destroy the failed clones, and another one later on that requires a bit of swimming. And despite how I feel about the film overall, I have to admit that that was a pretty cool scene that was really intricate and supposedly challenging to film. I also think it's a really neat touch how when you're playing as Ripley, her health bar is the same color as the acid blood, kind of reflecting how she's less than human. Weapons include pistols, which can be dual wielded later in the game. There's a shotgun, flamethrower, which is completely useless when not used against the facehuggers, a pulse rifle, grenade launcher, and late in the game, an electrical gun, which is so awful that it actually offends me. Kor gets access to a laser gun, which is probably the best weapon in the game by far. And then Christy gets access to a rocket launcher, which is another really good weapon, handy for clearing out groups of Xenos that are camping on the ceilings. The enemies are little more than just your basic run-of-the-mill Xenos, along with facehuggers and the remaining military personnel still on the ship. So overall, it does feel pretty faithful to the film, and it could have definitely served as some kind of official tie-in if it had have been released in time. I mean, it sure is a hell of a lot better than some of the other film-based video games that we got. I also see a lot of similarities between this and Doom 3. I mean, for starters, visually they're both very similar, taking place in a dimly lit space station that's been overrun by monsters. In Doom 3 it's obviously the demons, and in Alien Resurrection it's the Xenomorphs. They both completely lack music pretty much the entire time, relying more on ambient sound effects and audio cues to increase the tension. You can often hear people screaming off in the distance along with the rattling of the ship and the humming and buzzing of computer terminals and electricity. Then sometimes the only sound effect is your own footsteps. Followed quickly by the iconic beeping of your motion tracker as a Xeno starts bearing down on you, causing that sphincter to tighten up so hard that you could probably use it to crack walnuts. You often come across these grisly scenes where corpses are strewn across the room, and again, it's kind of similar to seeing the UAC employees in all of these ritualistic positions. Both games have a very similar AI presence making announcements. Will all non-essential personnel please report to lifeboats? Access granted. And they both have very similar looking doors, which open from the middle outwards. It's also common to open one of these doors and find a Xeno just standing there lying in wait. Again, kind of reminded me a fair bit of the imps waiting to pounce on you in Doom 3. More than that though, there's often not much verticality to the shooting. I mean, you look at the combat in both of these games and you're often shooting something that's on the same level as the player. In fairness, that wasn't always the case in Doom 3, but generally, you were always taking on a demon that was at ground level with the player. But on top of that, I think they're just really good looking games considering the time they came out. That's when you can actually see what's happening because the games can often be darker than a chimney sweeps asshole. Again, something else they've got in common. Despite all the shit that it got, the Doom 3 engine really was groundbreaking for the time, helping popularize things like real-time lighting, and then Alien Resurrection came at the back end of the PlayStation's lifespan, and that is easily one of the best looking games ever made for the platform. Even if that often does come at the expense of a steady frame rate. I'm still a pretty big proponent for emulation, I mean, I think with some titles it just objectively makes them better to play, especially games like GoldenEye, Perfect Dark and Time Splitters. but then again, there's just something about playing these games on the actual hardware that just seems to vastly improve them. I don't know man, it's something about that dithering effect on the PlayStation 1, it just makes these old games really appealing to me. When you boot up Resurrection, it even has this message telling you to play it in the dark, and yeah, at this point, you know you're going to see some serious shit, and you'll be really doing yourself a favour by playing it like that, so you're able to appreciate all the chonky goodness as it's meant to be, also really managing to appreciate how they've captured that same aesthetic from the film. More than that though, Resurrection is a first person survival horror game, first and foremost, and it really is one of the pioneers for the genre. Trying to find supplies in this game was often like trying to find Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. Medkits are really hard to come by and have to be used manually, and you've got a flashlight which burns out in mere seconds. Yeah, I love how technology's gotten to the point where space travel is mastered, and you can clone someone by finding a strand of their pubic hair, but a flashlight that lasts more than 15 seconds, well, that's somehow too much to ask for. 
You got things like camera sway when moving, which is also pretty unique for the time. And funnily enough too, this game has ladders that don't require a physics degree to operate. You walk up to a ladder, unequip your weapon automatically as you're attached to it, then press either up or down. In fact, moving down them, your character slides down a lot quicker, which is again pretty innovative for the time. And then compare that to Doom 3 and Half-Life 2, which came out a few years later, where we were still magically attaching ourselves to ladders with a weapon equipped. The game's control setup, though, is its most terrifying element. The left analog stick moves you forward, back, and strafes right and left, while the right analog stick turns you and can be used to look up and down. Yeah, that was an infamous quote taken from a GameSpot review for this thing back in the day, which actually marked the game down because it used what's now become the absolute standard for controls in first and third person shooters. And yeah, imagine that, GameSpot having a take that didn't age well. What it means though, is that the game is still pretty easy to pick up and play, considering it really doesn't differentiate all that much from modern console shooters. However, don't let that fool you into thinking this is going to be an easy ride because this is honestly one of the most cruel, unfair, and sadistic games I think I've ever played. Bitch! This game's version of easy mode is more like hard mode in any other game, and it's made even more insulting by the fact that the devs apparently defended the difficulty in recent interviews. Yeah, they claimed that the playtesters were able to beat this thing using only a pistol, which is about the biggest load of fucking bullshit that I've ever heard. Bullshit! And it's about the most idiotic thing I've heard since Riley Reid tried to rap. Who that is, Riley Reed with my booty fat. Bullshit! If you're wondering why some of the footage in this is at a different aspect ratio, well, it's because I bought a new upscaler halfway through playing through the game. Yeah, shout out to my Chi and the Retro Tink 5X. And to be honest, I'd rather dry hump a cactus plant than play through those first few levels again. And the reason for that is because this thing is just incredibly hard. Bruh. And everything you've heard about this game is probably true, and then some. I mean, look, I'm someone who really enjoys playing through games and the high difficulties, but even for me, this was just way too much. Resurrection can stake a claim at being survival horror, and it definitely has all the hallmarks. That being limited resources, manual save spots, and high lethality from enemies. Only, it also has the other hallmarks you'd see in a standard first-person shooter. That being a metric fuck-ton of enemies to deal with. But then it also retains that survival horror aspect of giving you bugger all health and ammo to deal with all of these enemies. I mean, even if you're being a complete tight ass here, that is, you know, firing in short controlled bursts, you are still going to be out of ammo constantly. And it really feels more like it's about trial and error than it is outright skill at times, because the level design likes to ambush you, and about the only way you can survive these is armed with the knowledge that it's going to happen, which can only exist with the foresight of knowing it's coming after you've already died to it. But even then, it is chock full of some good old fashioned horse shit. Like a boss fight against a guy who soaks up literally a hundred or so pulse rifle rounds that ends with a couple of flamethrower soldiers rushing into the room after you finally manage to kill him. Bullshit! Early on in the game you've got to kill the alien queen and they give you basically no supplies. Even then, after you finally kill up, all you get is a single medkit. A single medkit. I mean, that's like storming the beaches at Normandy and they're being given a band-aid for your efforts. On top of that, at some points in the game, it just starts spawning in Xenos at random, often a couple at a time. Because, yeah, that's a fantastic idea when you're always walking around with barely any spare ammo, isn't it? So, yeah, to reiterate, I really doubt that anyone's been able to beat this thing with a pistol. Gotta say, I still find it hard to believe someone has ever beat it playing through it normally. I had to turn on God Mode a couple of times just to see this thing through to the end, and even then, I still felt like the game was kicking my ass. Now, I do think that with a mouse and a keyboard, this would have been a hell of a lot easier. In fact, I actually ended up buying a PlayStation mouse for another video that I'm working on, which arrived after I'd finished Resurrection. But to test this thing out, I went back and played through those first few levels, and yeah, I've got to say, it does seem a bit easier. But then again, I'm not too sure if that's because of the mouse, or just because I know what's coming this time. The main thing it objectively improves, I think, is when you're trying to shoot the facehuggers, because you can be a lot more precise. So maybe this was all intended to be played with a more approachable control scheme, but all I know is on the consoles, this thing doesn't waste time in kicking your ass. Uh, uh, the first three or four levels aren't too bad and can be finished if you just keep your head down and stay frosty, but from that level where you start to play as De Stefano and then onward, it really just feels like if you make a single mistake, if you take too many hits, if you use up too much ammo, well, then you're really screwed from that point on because there just isn't enough ammunition or healing items to allow for previous mistakes. 
Then you go back to playing Ripley after this, and the ammo you had from playing as her from those levels prior carries on from this point on too. So if beforehand you're a bit too overzealous, play hard to get females get jealous, well then you're gonna be up shit creek without a paddle. The game uses manual save points, which is fine, but you'll often only get maybe two or three of these per level. And now consider that some of these levels can go for upwards of an hour. So it's like you're really just expected to play through encounter after encounter without making a single mistake. What it really means is that this is a genuinely frightening game to play because every single encounter you have can be your last. There's a section early on in the game where you've got to crawl through this narrow vent and you've got facehuggers approaching from the front and the back and I was genuinely shaking playing through this bit. It's actually kind of funny how a 20 year old game can still deliver more scares than any of the so-called horror games I've played in recent memory. It's just that a lot of this really does feel like first time traps designed to mess with the player and force constant retries. In the game's defense, it's not entirely unfair. I mean, you've got this quick 180 spin move, which is an absolute godsend and really helps when something suddenly attacks you from behind. I also really like that little detail how if a Xeno gets stuck in a doorway, when the door closes, their entire body just gets crushed and explodes. It's like someone stepping on a bag of Doritos. Probably the most annoying aspect here, I think, is how much resurrection relies on facehuggers pretty much as almost a common enemy. Compared to Alien Trilogy, where they were just more of a minor annoyance, once one of these things grabs onto your face, the screen fades out for a bit and then you wake up a short time later infected with a chestburster. At this point, you've got maybe 30 or so seconds before this thing bursts through your ribcage like a stripper popping out of a birthday cake. The only way to get rid of this thing is by using a specific item called an auto dock, which removes it, complete with this animation showing the chest burster being irradiated and removed. And it's a pretty cool idea for, you know, the first two or three times it happens, but then it just becomes really annoying. Firstly, because look, as much as I love face sitting, the patrician fetish, every time it happens, you have to watch that same 10 or so second long animation of your character slowly passing out and then getting back up on their feet. But secondly, and I think more importantly, is because there's only a finite amount of these auto docks in the levels, which means you're going to have to deal with the face huggers the old fashioned way by shooting them. And that's just this incredibly tedious process of shooting the eggs to coerce them out so you can then finish them off, ideally one by one so you don't get overwhelmed. Combined with the other moments when they'll just come out of nowhere scurrying towards you, where that handicap of the choppy controls and the low frame rate's gonna be your greatest challenge. In fact, I think it's actually more advisable to let yourself get face hugged, because after you've been infected, it seems the rest of the face huggers attack you instead. You know what I mean? You can't be face hugged twice. But they're really one of the most annoying enemies in the entire game, and that low FOV, which makes it really hard to see them sometimes, ain't helping either. I even had it happen a couple of times where right after using an auto dock, I'd suddenly find myself attacked again instantly by one that I couldn't even see. It reminded me of that scene in The Simpsons when Sideshow Bob just keeps walking into those rakes over and over. The point where I gave up trying to play through this thing properly was during the game's 6th level, of which there's 10 by the way, after having fought my way through hordes of enemy soldiers armed with pulse rifles and a colony's worth of Xenos, I barely made it to the next level with nothing but the pistol remaining. And I mean, in another FPS game that had any sense of fairness or general thought for the player's mental well-being, they'd begin a level like this with some basic health pickups or ammo, especially after a super crushing series of encounters that preceded it. I mean, that's just basic level design 101. Go and check out Half-Life for instance. The first chapter where you finally encounter the military, we've got hostiles. The first room of that chapter has a first aid kit and a HEV charger on the wall, one of the first things you see because they knew that what was coming next was gonna be a bit more challenging, so they made sure the player would have enough resources to defend themselves. Even the same thing as far back as Quake. Pretty much every level, you're gonna see some basic ammo and health pickups to help the player along, and give them just some kind of basic assistance. Now, I know those games aren't the same genre as Alien Resurrection is, but even still, if you go and play any survival horror games like Resident Evil or Silent Hill, those games knew that after tough encounters, it was only fair to give the player a small amount of resources. They managed to balance that combination of keeping the player stocked up with just the right amount of items they needed, but never to the point that you felt entirely comfortable. I'm so scared. And that's really, I think, why despite its brilliant presentation, its innovative gameplay elements and its horror aspect, that Alien Resurrection isn't as fondly remembered. 
because despite hiding behind this moniker of being an intentionally brutal horror shooter, which it is, it's brutal but for all the wrong reasons. I mean, to put it simply, this game is a cunt. Here, lion. The fact that the devs seem to have spent all their time inside some kind of echo chamber, where people stroked their egos and told them the difficulty was perfectly fine, probably didn't help things either. There's definitely games out there that are both genuinely hard and fun at the same time. Recently, something like Dead Cells is one that comes to mind, or a game like Cuphead, Risk of Rain 2, or Super Meat Boy. As for the FPS genre, more recently something like Doom Eternal. I mean, super crushing on Nightmare, but also still enjoyable and balanced. In those games, you're not failing because you don't have the means to succeed. You're failing because it was your own screw up. You didn't do what the game expected of you, and it punished you as a result. In Alien Resurrection, you just died because three Xenos rushed at you from a nearby room. The game hasn't given you a med kit for 15 minutes, you've only got one shotgun shell left and nothing but a pistol to fall back on. Oh yeah, and your last save file was about half an hour ago. So have fun replaying through all of that and pulling it all off again without a hitch. If it's supposed to be some kind of ironic experience, trying to simulate what would actually happen if a real person was in this situation, well, then I applaud them. Michael Wincott's death at the start of the movie, sorry, spoilers, is really about the most realistic scene in the entire film, and I think the fate that 90% of people would suffer from in real life. And it's again, another game that I'd really like to see remastered, because I think just being able to play this with the basic convenience of a smooth mouse and a keyboard setup, and more importantly, a stable frame rate, would make it a vastly improved experience because you can't deny that this is a masterpiece when it comes to the visual and audio design. You just can't fault how incredible this game's tone and atmosphere is. It's just a shame it ends up tougher than a rhino's ball sack. Ball sack. But I'll give it one thing, it's still more fun to play through than Alien 3. <laughs>